Um, I hope everyone's enjoying today. We've got um, we've got a, a very special talk on now. We have Asma from um, Slalom who's doing a talk about quality through observability. So I hope you enjoy. All right, so I'm the only one standing between your afternoon tea, and I think we all need that dose of caffeine, so let's give it a go. All right, so how many of us wanted to be a pilot when we were very young, in almost every grade three or grade four, they ask you, what do you want to be? And you're like, all right, a teacher, a, a stewardess, an air hostess, or maybe some of you said a pilot, so Lisa definitely said a pilot. Anyone else in the crowd who wanted to be a pilot? All right, a few hands there. All right, so let's close our eyes, as Lisa said. It's been a long day. Let's imagine, just for humor me, just maybe five seconds, let's close our eyes and imagine that we're a pilot flying an awesome jet. There's sunset on the side. There are clouds under us. It's going very smooth. And we have a lot of controls available for us to guide us that our flight is going smooth or not. A lot of tools and observability here and there to guide us through our journey. All right, let's come back. Open our eyes. All right, so as a pilot, we have all of these awesome tools to guide us that our flight is very smooth. Now let's bring this to our software world that if we bring it to a software world, which is mostly our bread and butter, if we don't have these observability tools guiding us about our quality, we are essentially flying blind. And we have our fingers crossed that hopefully everything is gonna go well. I tested it two weeks back, but hopefully everything's still gonna go well. So today what we'll talk about is quality through observability. Now, you may say, which we'll come down to that perception as well, that monitoring observability is just for DevOps. It's for infrastructure. Quality, really? Testers, really? Do we want to talk about observability? So we'll disrupt some of those perceptions as well. Yep, come right up. Quite a few seats up in here. So. I'm Asma Gulbaz. I'm working as a quality engineering leader at Slalom, which is a technology consulting company. Um, over the course of my career, uh, 15 plus in quality engineering, I've worked in product SaaS companies as well as technology companies. Some of the clients have definitely given me a few grays, uh, but a lot of learning along the way. And this talk actually is a premise of all the learnings that we've done as a working group in my consulting company, because we have that. Hey, you want to learn around some space? Create a working group, let's learn together. And then we can apply that knowledge to our clients and our products together. So this is just a small little quick introduction for myself. Can anybody guess which Gen AI tool I would have used for that image over there? I'm not promoting anything, but GeneCraft is one of my most favorite ones to create any Gen AI tool. And you can see the scribbled kind of keyboard that gives it away, and usually the hands and the eyes that gives it away as well. Because we're living in a world where we don't know what is real and what is not real. So it's gonna get worse, or maybe for better. So uh, that's an interesting thing that I found. All right, so let's give it a go. What is observability? Observability is actually the practice of actively monitoring maybe multiple data sets, data sources, allowing for proactive problem resolution. Because if I was to say one word to define quality engineering, I would say prevention. Not detection, prevention. So observability helps us keep a proactive perspective on our quality by monitoring it and identifying the root cause of issues. All right, what else is observability? 
observability goes beyond monitoring. We've heard these two terms in the past. The most legacy term in the world has been monitoring. Now, we've taken that technology one step higher and observability has been incepted. So what is observability? Observability is not just monitoring. Because monitoring says this action, this issue happened right now, that's it. Observability gives you another greater context on top of it, that what were the different sources, what were the different services involved? What happened? What was the root cause? What was taking more time? So that's the power with observability in the modern age. It's not just monitoring. It's context added on top of monitoring. And it is not just for production. That's another perception that we're going to disrupt today. Observability is not just for production data. It can also be used in our in-house ongoing development so that we make sure that we're building in quality from the beginning. Build it right the first time, right? That's our motto as QEs. Don't create bad quality code. Build it first, build it right the first time. So observability can help us through that and we'll learn a few ways how we can do that today. Another perception, like I surfaced in the beginning as well, isn't observability just for the SRE folks and DevOps? Why are we talking about it in a QE conference, right? So that's the disruption there. There are so many features in these observability tools now. They have tapped that market and made our lives really easy. There's a whole quality lens to observability tools now. Gone are the days when it was just for the DevOps and infrastructure people, tracking the utilization, servers are up and down or not. Nope. There's a whole world for us QEs and testers to tap into. So we'll take a look into that as well. And my goal is always, I attended another conference on uh, Monday in Melbourne, and I learned something from there was, what can I do Monday? So we're going to have that kind of lens in this uh, session as well, that what can you take away so that you can think about it on Monday and start thinking about, hey, can I do this in my product? Let's start from the top, because some people may have worked with observability, some may have not. Has anyone here worked with observability in the past? Yep, awesome, awesome. It's a few hands there. Let's break it down. I'm a very visual person. I hope many of you are visual as well. Let's break it down. Where do I begin with? Sounds interesting, maybe. One of my professors used to say, yes, no, maybe. So maybe I want to turn that into yes by the end of this session. So do I need observability? Let's ask ourselves that. All right. The next question would be, all right, if I need observability, what is my need? Do I need to look at the front end? Do I need to look at the back end? What is the problem that I want to fix with observability? That's the second question that you can ask yourself. All right, I've identified what is my need, what I need to track. I have a vague idea. Where should I observe it? Which tool should I go to? Which tool is going to fulfill my requirements and yet not cost me an arm and a leg. So cost analysis, comparative analysis that we always do. How should I observe? And then at the end of all of this journey, what we're going to get is we'll be well set up to make informed decisions because the logic is going to show you how, what is the health of your application? What is the health of your feature? And then we can make informed decisions where to fix it. We can take it to the devs and be like, look at the performance of this. We need to fix this before we go to prod. High level. All right, let's go one step deeper. Why do I need observability? 
So in my career working with different clients, what we've come around are some of these very important common problems. Rapid growth in my organization has led to poor service quality, and I just don't know where to begin. And we saw that a lot with, I was working with a very famous, well-known uh, retail t-shirt kind of a brand in Australia. In COVID, our online sales just skyrocketed, right? And that growth was so exponential. So let's take it from here. Rapid growth, right? That rapid growth, especially during COVID days, let's say, your web application is not performing like it did in 2018. Or Christmas season, business is always looking out for skyrocketing sales, and they have some targets that we need to meet, but our infrastructure just can't meet it. It just dies down on us. And we just don't know where to begin. Because we have no insight to identify which of our services is doing bad. And all of this is related to our quality, right? Because a P1 issue comes around, and usually, we like it or not, our neck is on the line. That, hey, let's contact the P1 testing team who tested this. So where are the main stakeholders of these problems? Long troubleshooting times. We just don't know where to begin, which service is taking that long. All right, which leads us to what is my need? Which could be that I want to improve customer experience. It could be that I want to enable faster troubleshooting time because the dev team is just taking too long to restore the service. Assess infrastructure stability because, hey, Christmas season, it's just not doing well. So all of these kind of just common examples of what your need could be. Thank you. Now, where should I observe? And we'll discuss a few tools that we can uh, look into as well, which could be, does it offer centralized dashboards? Because I just want one-stop shop. I don't want to look at 20 dashboards, 20 metrics. Track less so that you can get some informed decision-making based on that. That is my key goal in my career. Don't track more, track less. And cost to the tool, of course, is very important. How should I observe? All technical details. Google will tell you. ChatGBD will tell you. And we'll look a little bit into that as well. Value, again, the main purpose, the business value that Simon was also talking about, and working in a technology consulting company, business value is at the core of everything we do. People don't want to talk to you if you're not highlighting the business value. Same goes for any product SaaS company. Your leaders will not get your attention. They will not have your attention if you're not talking about the bottom line, the ROI. What is the ROI? Your next Christmas season is going to be much better. We're going to restore service in a more efficient way because troubleshooting time is less. All of these are ROI for the observability. All right. Enough talk. We're all technical people. Let's get technical, right? What can I do come Monday? Or what can I start learning come Monday? OK, we've already spoken about this first step. Identify your needs and tool. And these are just a subset. As I said, we have an open market right now with observability. These are just tip of the iceberg, the most common tools that we're seeing with observability. And over here, if you see, what kind of needs do they fulfill? Data, if you're passionate about data observability, your problem is data, then look out for the D1s, I infrastructure, front end, and back end. So as you can see, like the paid tools over here, of course, they're paid. So they give you like a full stack 
if you're able to win this with your leadership, your life is going to be so much fun because sky is the limit as to what we'll see here. But of course, there's a cost there. But open source as well, there are quite a few things that we can still leverage. All right, so we've identified our tool, which is good. Comes on the second step. That we have our needs, we have our tool. How do we create the connection between the tool and our application? What really happens at the back end? How is data usage, so usage data, just flowing in from the application onto these tools? What is happening? And one word, if I can point out over here, instrument the application is a key word here. Because observability, like there's some key words that we use in the world of observability. Instrument is the word that you want to look out for. Because we got to Google the right words, right? So instrument the application is what we say. That we're setting it up to open that fire hose of knowledge, of data. All right, so what do we do for, to instrument the application? Essentially, this is just an example of Datadog, but essentially all the other observability tools follow the same way. And they're coming up with one command does it all kind of integrations now. That you just do npm install, save dev, one command is going to install everything for you. It's going to set up the agent for you. One stop shop. They're coming up with that now as well. Essentially what happens is we just have to include a few libraries, install a few libraries in our application which will live in your GitHub repo alongside your application. And all of the usage data that the users might be using anywhere in the world, it's built in, in with the package. It's built inside the application, right? So whenever usage is happening, these libraries are just going to take the data, put it to the agent, and the agent just transfers it to the UI interface of these tools. So that's very simple architecture. As I said, it was a very complex process that we needed platform engineers, infrastructure engineers to create these integrations, instrumentation of the application. But now it's become very easy that even technical QEs can do that on their own. Having said that, this is a classic combination of a PE, platform engineer, infrastructure engineer, working with QEs because we want to disrupt the silos, right? We're all agile. We've got to practice cross-functionality. How can we disrupt the silos and work together? This is a classic combination to work with them. Just a quick snippet of how easy it could look and how these tools give a step-by-step -step process to improve the usability of that instrumentation. And automatically, as soon as you create that instrumentation, that link, so many off-the-shelf tools or features come around. Like this is one of my most favorite ones. You've created the connection, the connection between the tools it's been tested. We start using the application. And as soon as data starts flowing in, these service maps get created automatically. You'll just log into your tool, and the service map will be magically just ready for you. It's created all of these connections on their own. Like we can see that there's a front end, which is going to, I think that's a DB over there. This is the cache. It goes all the way to Postgres. So it's connected all of this high level for us. And it's telling us if some of these were read, we could catch up with the devs that, gosh, what is happening in our staging environment? Have you merged in some code which is not sitting in well? Because observability is telling us it's all red. All right. So now let's go to the third step, which is configure metrics and monitoring. This is the ground core of everything, right? That what do we monitor? What do we observe from a quality lens? not from an infrastructure DevOps perspective, from our 
bread and butter, what do we want to track to make our lives easy? So we won't talk about a lot of things because sky is the limit with observability, but let's only look at application performance monitoring. And as I said over here, we don't have to wait for prod to start observing. We can do it in staging or any kind of environments that your PE or infrastructure helps you set up. We can track those as well and track our internal testing purposes. And track it over time as well, right? Like if you have larger projects that are one year old, we could be, hey, the application was really good in Jan, but since July, we can see trends going down. Rather than maintaining reports, this is gonna give you that automatic trend over time. So let's only look at, let's say, these three things to begin with. Data, backend, frontend. Infrastructure can be done with DevOps. We don't need to focus too much on that, but just the tip of the iceberg for now, because we do work with front-end, back-end, and data a lot. How many of us work with front-end a lot? Yep, awesome. Back-end as well, with APIs here and there. Data queries too, awesome. So we have a mix, so these three would be useful. All right, so again, coming up with the keywords. These two are very important keywords in observability, which are synthetic monitoring and RUM, real user monitoring. All right, let's look at the benefits and differences. Like, can anybody guess? what this is. I mean, I think it's written there. I should have uh, blanked them out. Yep. Uh, the synthetics is like your, your automated test is kind of checking the results. Real user monitoring is traces from real user sessions. Right? Perfect. We're going to be good friends. Awesome. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what's your kind name? Nick. Nick. As Nick said, robots, which is our automated tests, we can write automated tests through these tools. That is synthetic monitoring. It's simulated behavior that we do, right? We write it with Cypress, Playwright, all of that is simulated behavior. So synthetic monitoring is that simulated behavior. RUM, real, real user monitoring, is of course the actual users that we're tracking from across the world, wherever the application is being used. So benefits of each, of course, proactive monitoring, but if we keep on running these automated tests through these tools, not even with these tools or not, like let's say if you had playwright tests running in our CI CD, it's gonna take it as real user data because it's not simulated through the application. But these ones are simulated behaviors, proactive. But let's say if our application goes down in LA and we're running a test in LA region every day, we'll get to know about it first, that hey, our test is breaking down. Performance trends over time, as I said, geolocation, uh, we'll have small little examples showcasing this as well. Then RUM, of course, real user experience, what kind of browsers are they on, what kind of devices are they on, trends over time, which many other tools give you, but it could be a one-stop shop for us. And this is just a very quick example of what could be. Like for example, if I add synthetic monitoring, these are some of the options that I could get that I can trigger API tests through this, multi-step API tests, browser tests, which is just your record, your workflow on the application to record and play, like low code kind of automation that we do or mobile application test. So just simple tests of record and play can give you so much of observability over here. And I can choose which locations I want these tests to be run in. Do I want them in each continent every day, every six hours? I can schedule them as well. And these kind of dashboards, 
just hold on to that thought of LCP and CLS. We'll address that. Those are front end metrics. But you can see that over here, I can create graphs which are going to be automated as the usage is happening. So in a very quick drag and drop way, and actually they come up with these dashboards automatically as samples. So you can clone them. I clone this and I just removed what I didn't need. So this is all off the shelf kind of capability of quality through observability. And we can see that we ran these tests on just two devices. All right, let's talk about backend a little bit. So as simple as we can create monitors that you know what, I have 20 API endpoints that I want to track that they should be performing, let's say, under 200 milliseconds every time. Even if I'm testing in staging environments, like how good are my endpoints quality and performance over time? So these kind of monitors help us that let's say when the data starts flowing in, this yellow highlighted aspect there, it's a drag and drop. It's a drop down rather, sorry. It will give you all the endpoints that the data has been flowing in for. So if your application has been, you've been using your application through manual testing or automation, the data has started flowing in. You can track it here and you can give any kind of averages, like for example, it should always be, this, which, this should be actually above, it should be less, it should always be less than two seconds. 0.2 seconds could be it as well. So this way, you can track that my endpoints, dev, what have you done in the last merge? Because my endpoint that I tested last week was supposed to be just 0.2 seconds. And now it's taking five seconds. So we've merged something which we're not supposed to. And these are some of the metrics uh, that we can track over there. Latency, throughput, the sky's the limit what we can do over there. These are some of the more examples like DB, query time performance as well. I'll showcase an example where it includes all the services that a single transaction took. And I'll come to that uh, image and then we'll explain that further. All right, let's come to front end. Uh, pro tip, this slide is very important. I'm not saying why, this is very important. <laughs> okay. So when we're testing from the front end, we look out for a lot of things, right? That this test case should pass, this button should be there. Sometimes we track through, let's say, Chrome Lighthouse. Is the performance of the front end good or not? But trend over time of front end is a very important thing, which we're not able to track in a very low cost effective way. So a lot of metrics just come off the shelf, but three which are always there whenever we have front end data coming in, this is automatically generated. So you can imagine that when you're creating your test reports, these kind of graphs which everybody gets excited about that, hey, don't tell me the numbers. Show me some kind of trend over time. Show me some kind of figures which can give me the confidence with data that I'm ready to release or not, right? So this enables you to get those statistics to provide your TSRs, your testing conclusions with evidence. So let's say LCP is, it's a kind of industry front-end metric which is measures how fast the largest element can load and appear on the website. Rather than us, I've, I've done that from the times like, let's say eight years back, I was working in a sports technology company and every second counts in sports, right? 
So we used to have our timers on the side that let's say this data came in and what's the time and taking screenshots of the times and whatnot. So gone are those days because we can track it from here. And we, we're not even tracking it. The tool is tracking it for us. First input delay measures how responsive a website page are, pages are when user interact with them for the first time. CLS confession, it took me a little bit of time to understand the main purpose of CLS. And that's why I thought that if I, I've been reading about these things quite a bit, for you to attend something in 30, sec, uh, 30 minutes, I included a, a video for this as well. I'll play this, hopefully I can play it. And if somebody can help me understand what went wrong in this video, like what is the issue that we're talking about? We see some panic. All right. Yeah, so what went on here? What happened? Yeah, exactly. Like 56 items are on their way. We can't do anything about it now. It's gone. So let's look again. Why do we think that happened? It shifted, right? Exactly. Exactly. So there was a pop-up that loaded a little while later. And as soon as that popped, the content layout just organized itself where it's supposed to be. But it just loaded incorrectly at the, at the wrong time. And there you go, 56 things coming your way. So that's what CLS is about this would be so difficult for us to track and we may not understand this user experience until somebody calls us from New York or wherever. So this is so difficult to anticipate, right? And with this kind of automation, we can track it. We won't let it ship. All right. So cumulative layout shift. And over here, we had largest contentful paint, first input delay. All right, let's move ahead. How are we going on time, Lisa, do we know? Five to 10 minutes? OK. So this is, again, what I surfaced above. I told you to ignore it at that time. But it tells us, if you see good, needs improvement, and poor, we don't have to do any kind of mapping or anything. It's going to already tell us in this automated graph that we're in the green zone. So we're in the good zone. And over here, you can also see cumulative layout. It's already telling us that, yep, you're somewhat in the amber yellow state, needs improvement. So we can take this to our devs that, hey, why is the front end in the needs improvement stage? How can we bring it to the good side? And I'll show you an image how we can go with the evidence in an informed way, because we're all technical people. We can read a lot of things that other people can read as well. So notification rules. What if something goes wrong, right? How do we get notified? We can get notified through emails. We can get notified through Slack. There's so many integrations. And what they're also doing with these tools now is they're creating workflows that if an issue happens, you have to do this to correct it as well. Like let's say restart the application or whatever, which is of course never the a good solution there, but sometimes it is that restart the server. All right, so if something happens, it can restart the server as well through a workflow. All right, last one, monitor and improve, which is just showcasing the complexity, yet the simplicity, of the dashboards that we can create without any extra effort. And this is your one-stop shop that, let's say, my endpoints, how are they doing? My error rates, where am I seeing them? So many things 
transaction times. It's just going to any kind of one-stop shop that you can define with your business as well. What do we want to see? What will give you the confidence that our application is doing well? Sit with them. Get their input as well. Last thing, two also very important keywords in observability that took me a bit of time to kind of very quickly understand, very simple to understand, traces and span. A trace is a whole, if you recall, like one endpoint transaction. It's the whole trace, a whole endpoint request going back and forth. That's an entire trace. We call it a trace. A span is small little services that got used in the middle. So if you see it with this image, this is what I was talking about. This is the level of data that we have access to that QEs can use. Like for example, this query, if this was a very long query, then I know that my DB is not indexed well. And I can go to the devs that, gosh, in my endpoint, DB query was taken the longest. Why? Is there no indexing there or anything else to improve the DB performance? So this whole thing from 0 to 60 would be a trace Small, small things in the middle are spans. So we can say to them, like, hey, Dev, one of the span was taking so much long. Let's dig in deeper. What kind of services, what is recalling, and whatever things. So this level of analysis, this data, becomes available to us, rather than just the devs who are working under the hood and we don't know their, half of their story. We can be well informed. I won't go into these infrastructure metrics. Uh, but good to know what the infrastructure team is utilizing, but slightly unrelated to us. Come Monday, what do we want to do? There are amazing learning paths. It, it would have been useful if I was advocating for these tools and I was getting something out of this, but I'm not. But in my experience, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other observability tools as well. They have really good learning paths which would not only tell you about the tools, it would tell you about Observability 101. They start with Observability 101, which is just generic to everyone. So if you're eager to kind of learn about this space and how QEs can progress into this, just take any 101 observability from these um, sources. So the last message, embrace the quality lens of observability to make sure that we keep flying smoothly, not blindly, and then we have the data to prove that we're flying very smooth. Thank you. <laughs> Last, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, question, sure thing. Uh, do we have time for question? Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, there we go. You heard my tip correct. Yep, he got it. Yeah, yeah. The last one over there. Yep. So he raised his hand even before. <laughs> so he got the first person uh, advantage there. Yeah. Your sex. Thank you very much. Thank it you. was very insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Any questions? Anything that you feel? Yep. Yeah, very good question. If I can repeat the question, that how can we leverage these tools, and you can correct me if, my, if I'm not understanding that correctly, how can we leverage these tools to reduce the automation suite maybe, and leverage this to help with the automation side of things? So 
my first uh, suggestion over there would be the API test that I surfaced. Uh, so synthetic monitoring gives you that power that these kind of tests will help you not create a redundancy. You don't have to automate them again through your frameworks. You can just use these tools and automate them. So there we go. So these ones, of course, this is record and play for the UI tests. So there might be some complicated workflows that you may not be able to automate over here. So take the UI test with a grain of salt, but the API test, any endpoint can be triggered through here. So your API testing can come here completely. Yeah, would need to be looked into if a simple like kind of export that Postman, let's say, provides, if that is a drag and drop kind of a feature available. I'm sure they have some there. Like let's say Postman is a very common tool, so I wouldn't be surprised if the whole collection can just be exported over here. Would need to be looked into. But I'm sure there's some capacity. If not, then it would have to be rewritten. Yeah, it would have to be rewritten then. So that would be that you run your API test just like they are. And if you're running them in staging environment, it will come into RUM. It will come into real user monitoring. Because they will say, I mean, it's just going to pick up whatever usage of the application was. It doesn't care about if it was triggered by automation or if it was triggered manually. It's going to come in real user monitoring. So you could say environment is equal to staging and all the data will just keep on coming there then. Yeah, very good question. No, none at all, because they're very lightweight kind of libraries, like new relic.js would just get created, you just add it to your bundle, and very lightweight libraries. Uh, yeah. Yep. So that's a blanket true for everyone. Mm. I remember when I first implemented, I think it was Dynamics back when it first came out, 25% increase in CPU. Mm. So, right? But that's not necessarily the problem of the product, it's your architecture and how it behaves with it, how you do your resource allocation, how you manage your memory. So you have to be careful about how you implement it depending on the legacy of your application. Good input. Awesome. All right. I think we're good. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you.